man of the Lord, we got to be able to go into the Bible and prove what we preach. Shalom. Most High Christ bless is Officer Mendel. Welcome to a special edition of Truth Be Told. Uh, this is a subsection. It's called Prove All Things. And the reason why we got this going on is because a lot of statements are made um, a lot of untruths are pulled, you know, put out there by various pastors and different people like that. But at the end of the day, they never prove it. So the purpose of this show is what we're going to do is we're going to take different topics and we're going to prove it through the scriptures uh, using historical uh, documentation, all of those things. And then we challenge uh, people to send these uh, videos out to their pastors and get them to try to prove us wrong. So. Without further ado, let's get into the scriptures. We're going to start uh, with uh, 1 Thessalonians 5 and uh, 21. Let's get that. This is the book of 1 Thessalonians, chapter 5, verse 21. Prove all things. Hold fast that which is good. So that's what we got to do. When we, if we men of the Lord, we got to be able to go into the Bible and prove what we preach. So let's, let's go to the next scripture. Let's get Isaiah 41 and 21. Let's go there. Because this is what we're challenging uh, pastors to do. It's the book of Isaiah, chapter 41, verse 21. Produce your cause, saith the Lord. Bring forth your strong reasons, saith the king of Jacob. So if you, so like today's topic is, does color matter? That's the topic of the day. And a lot of times we hear uh, people that's in Christianity say color don't matter. It don't matter uh, what color Christ is and all of these different things. So what we're going to do is we're going to give an example. Then we're going to come back to the scripture. We're going to give some examples of some prominent uh, so-called Christians, uh, people like that, and not so prominent people, and they all make the same claim. But what we're going to do is we're going to go into the scriptures. We're going to go into prophecy. We're going to go into history, and we're going to prove that color does matter. Go ahead. Let's get the video. Crown more thorns instead. I am saved within not by your skin, no, but because your blood is red, oh, yeah. Some say you're black, you're white. Yes. They question if you're real. All right, so let's get the next video. So we already started out, you see? They say it don't matter if you're black or you're white, it's your, your blood is red. So let's, let's, let's keep it moving. What did he say? For he is not a Jew which is one outwardly, uh -huh. neither is that circumcision which is outward in the flesh. But what? But he is a Jew. He is a Jew. Which is one inwardly. And many of you folk running around, black this, black that, black the other. And then you other white folk, white this, white power, white power, white power. Yeah. White power. Black power, white power, black power, white power, black power, no power. You want to know real power? Let every soul look at the universe. That's right. Look at the sun. Ask yourself, how did it get there? Look at the moon and the stars. Ask yourself, how did it get there? Bible said God made the earth by his power and established the world by his wisdom and stretched forth the heavens by his understanding. So when Jesus come here, it's not about black, white, yellow, brown, some of you say when you marry a white person, you marry out of your race. A white person is a human being. So now, he made a lot of strong statements there. He even got into interracial marriage, and we're going to cover that in one of our episodes. We're going to cover that. But like I said, everybody's saying that these things don't matter. But if it don't matter, why is it written in the Bible? Let's get the last video. It's a short one. Is Jesus black or is he white? It doesn't matter. He's the savior of the world. So you see the foolishness that's out there? You know, everybody's saying that, you know, the color don't matter, the race don't matter, but nobody's pulling any scriptures to prove it. So let's go back to Isaiah 41, 21 through 22, so we can get into this. It's the book of Isaiah, chapter 41, verse 21. Produce your cause, save the Lord. 
Bring forth your strong reasons, say the king of Jacob. Read. Let them bring them forth and show us what shall happen. Let them show the former things what they be, that we may consider them and know the latter end of them, or declare us things for to come. So that's what we challenge in the pastors to do. They got to go, they got to show us prophecy. They got to go back in the past. They got to do all of these things. They got to produce their cause. Let's go to Acts 17 and 11. Let's get that real quick. This is the book of Acts, chapter 17, verse 11. These were more noble than those in Thessalonica, in that they received the word with all readiness of mind and searched the scriptures daily, whether those things were so. So that's what we got to be ready to do. So we got to receive the scriptures with all readiness of mind. And then what we got to do is when we hear things come out, we got to go through the scriptures to see if it's so. So if he's saying that, you know, if these different people are saying color don't matter, they got to be able to go into the scriptures and prove that. You should go into the scriptures and, and see if what they're saying is so. So let's see. Let's just use some worldly examples of how our color matters. Let's get the uh, video. Let's get the next video of uh, our president. In Limert Park, an historic black neighborhood in Los Angeles, you could see. And I would not be standing here tonight without the unyielding support of my best friend. Obama Day. Uh -huh. Yes. <laughs> and here, the optimism. We all know the past, and um, we're now going into the future. And uh, most people think it's just about time. The reality is still sinking in here that America voted for the nation's first African-American president, Barack Obama. And at Penn's Diner in Ladera Hills, another of LA's many black enclaves, breakfast was sizzling and the morning conversation was hot. And to see it in my lifetime, I think when I was a little girl, everyone would always say, oh, I want to be a president, I want to be the first black president, but to know that it's happening in my lifetime is amazing. For president-elect Obama. Our dreams are being realized as Americans, not as blacks, not as whites, but as American, as the people that America was founded upon. We were all founded, America was founded to provide religious freedom and economic freedom to everybody. And I'm just happy to be alive this day. After voting myself. Afro-American studies professor Elizabeth Kent Britton says President-elect Obama will start, not end a national conversation on race. Slaves, when the White House was first being constructed, built it. There were white workers, but also the majority were slaves. Their owners were getting paid, the slaves were not, the princely sum of $5 a week. And now we have an African-American man and his family who will be living in the White House. So maybe the words of poet Langston Hughes are finally ringing true. Tomorrow I'll be at the table when company comes. Nobody will dare say to me, eat in the kitchen then. Besides, they'll see how beautiful I am and be ashamed. I too am America. It's been a long time coming. Just being here enjoying it. John Moan, the Associated Press, Los Angeles. Change has come to America. Now, I thought these pastors say color don't matter. Look at how excited the people are about uh, uh, the first black president. If color don't matter, then why is that such a big deal? It shouldn't have been a big deal. Everybody should have been like just another day. You understand that? So we're going to get into this thing. We're going to show you that um, the reason why a lot of people say that color doesn't matter because they've been deceived by Satan himself. We're going to prove that out of the scriptures. Satan himself has tricked everybody into thinking that these things, the nations don't matter, color don't matter. So we're going to prove it. Let's get the uh, Zondervan Compact Bible Dictionary. Let's start dealing with this thing. This is the Zondervan Compact Bible Dictionary. Definition of Ham. Ham, the youngest son of Noah, born probably about 96 years before the flood, and one of eight persons to live through the flood. He became the progenitor of the dark races, not the Negroes. So he, he's not the forefather of the Negroes. So let's get the photo of the Negro. Everybody knows what the Negro looks like. So let's see. Let's get the Negro up there. So that's your Negro. Keep reading. So he, he's not our forefather, because we're called Negroes here in America. But whose forefather is he? Read. 
but the Egyptians. So look at the Egyptians. This is this is this is what you would call today your so-called Africans. So they're letting you know that the Negroes are not an African. We don't have the same forefather. Read. Ethiopian. So the Ethiopian. That's next. Let's get the Ethiopian. Very similar. Very similar look. Read. Libyans. Okay, so let's get the Libyan. Very similar look. All of these are dark races. Read. And Canaanite. And the Canaanite. So the Negro, even though he looks a lot like the Libyan, the Ethiopian, the Egyptian, the Canaanite, they're, we're not related. We got different forefathers. So who's the forefather of the Negro? What did the, and, and what did the ancient Israelites look like? Let's deal with the ancient Israelites. Because the ancient Israelites aren't African. They descend from Shem. So let's read about an ancient Israelite. Let's go to Acts 21 and 37. Let's get that. This is the book of Acts, chapter 21, verse 37. And as Paul was to be led into the castle, he said unto the chief captain, May I speak unto thee? Who said, Canst thou speak Greek? Art not thou that Egyptian? Hold on. They mistaken Paul for who? Art not thou that Egyptian? So Paul was mistaken as an Egyptian. Let's get the image of Paul up on the screen. So this is what this is uh, something what Paul would have looked like. So he's speaking to the chief captain. He mistook Paul as an Egyptian. Hmm. So that's giving you the first clue on what the Israelites look like because we just read that the Egyptians descend from Ham, and Ham is the forefather of the dark races. So uh, keep reading. Let's finish it out. Art not thou that Egyptian, which before these days made us an uproar and led us out into the wilderness 4,000 men that were murderers? Okay, so let's finish that. Let's get the uh, next book. Let's get the book called The Way. Let's get that book. And let's see what they have to say in this book about the so-called Negro. This is the book The Way. Ham is the ancestor of the Canaanites. Ham was not the ancestor of the Negro. Uh-oh. So we got two different sources letting us know that, guess what, so-called African-Americans, you don't descend from Africans. That's what the scholars know. Read. Canaanites were Ham's descendants. So you don't descend from Ham. We don't descend from Ham. So who do we descend for, from? So let's, uh, let's, get, let's, get, uh, let's, let's deal with another one of our uh, forefathers. Let's deal with Moses. This is the book of Exodus, chapter 2, verse 16. Now the priest of Midian had seven daughters, and they came and drew water and filled the troughs to water their father's flock. And the shepherds came and drove them away. But Moses stood up and helped them and watered their flock. So we're dealing with Moses right now. Read. And when they came to Reuel, their father, he said, How is it that ye are come so soon today? And they said, an Egyptian delivered us out of the hand of the shepherds. Hold on, what did they call Moses? And they said, an Egyptian delivered us out of the hand of the shepherds and also drew water enough for us and watered the flock. So Moses was mistaken as an Egyptian. So that's letting you know what? That Moses was a dark man because we know that the Egyptians descend from Ham. So now let's get let's do a little bit of research on the Negro. Let's get this book right here, The Critical Review or Annals of Literature, volume 57. Now this is a reprint, and this book was written, I think, in the mid-1800s. So we're going to get a, a couple spots on here. This is the book, The Critical Review or Annals of Literature, volume 57. Pope Nicholas V, in the famous bull by which he granted the unknown world to the Portuguese and Spaniards, expressly permitted and ordered the Christians to reduce all infidels into slavery. So now this is starting to send us into slavery. So let's find out who went into slavery. Let's read this highlighted area right here. King John II in 1492 expelled all the Jews. He expelled who? All the Jews. Read. To the island of St. Thomas which had been discovered in 1471 and to other Portuguese settlements on the continent of Africa. And from these banished Jews, the black Portuguese, as they are called... They're called the what? 
black Portuguese, Read. as they are called, and the Jews in Luongo, who are despised, even by the very Negroes, are so descended. So it's letting you know that the Negroes despise the Jews who they descend from. So that's letting you know because you got to think about it. If the Negro's not a, uh, a African, he doesn't descend from Ham, the scholars know this. Now what the scholars are telling you in this book right here is that Negroes descend from the Jews. Read. Keep reading. By these colonists, St. Thomas soon became a considerable place of trade and valuable for its sugar plantations. Thirty years after their settlement, not less than 156,000 Arabs of 30 pounds weight each of sugar were exported and the engines of 50 sugar works turned by slaves. These Negroes were purchased in Guinea, Congo, and Manicongo, and the colonists had plantations furnished. furnished with from 150 to 3,000 Negro slaves. So this whole, the whole point of this is to show you that the Negroes descend from the Jews. The Negroes and the Jews are one and the same. This is what the historians know. This is what the scholars know. That's why when we read uh, Out of the Way, the definition of Ham, they let you know that the Negroes do not descend from Africans. We also read that in the Zondervan Compact Bible Dictionary. So now let's go to Genesis 2 and 7. <clears throat> let's get that. This is the book of Genesis, chapter 2, verse 7. And the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground. So the first man on the, in, on the earth was created from the dust of the ground. So we understand that the soil, the deeper you go, the darker it gets. So this is already setting the stage, letting you know that the first man is a black man. And we're going to read about the birth of the white man as we get on later on. Uh, in this in this um, segment, so let's go. Let's jump down to. Let's get Jeremiah fourteen and two. And we get the picture of that up too. This is the book of Jeremiah, chapter fourteen, verse two. Judah mourneth, and the gates thereof languish; they are black unto the ground. So, this is letting you know that the Jews are in mourning; their gates languish because that's where the leadership would stand in the gates. They had bad leadership. Like, we got bad leadership today. You got President Biden going to sit down with a stripper. What was it, Cardi B or something like that? These are the people that represent us. We got bad leadership today. We had bad leadership back then. So it says they are black unto the ground, letting you know the color of the Jews. They are people of color. They are black, very dark-skinned people. So let's go. Let's get another uh, illustration of that. Let's go to... Songs of Solomon, because colors mentioned all throughout the Bible. But I guarantee if you're at home right now and you Google Jews, you're not going to get these type of images. I guarantee you that. This is the Song of Solomon, chapter 1, verse 1. The Song of Songs, which is Solomon's. So this is King Solomon's writings. Let's jump down to verse 5. Verse 5. I am black. Hold on. King Solomon said he's what? I am black. Read. But comely. So I'm black and handsome. Read. O ye daughters of Jerusalem, as the tents of Kedar. So if you know anything about the tents of D uh, Kedar, they were a very dark uh, colored tent, like a black, almost black tent. So he's saying he's dark like those tents of Kedar. Read. As the curtains of Solomon. All right. So let's jump to Songs of Solomon 5 and 11. Let's get that. Song of Solomon, chapter 5, verse 11. His head is as the most fine gold. Because Solomon had gold dust in his hair. Read. His locks are bushy. His locks are what? His locks are bushy. So he had locks. How many people you know looking like, uh, what's his name, Charleston Heston got locks in the hair? Come on, man. Y'all can't be serious. Read. His locks are bushy. And black as a raven. So it's giving you it's giving you plenty of descriptions of what the prophets look like, what the kings look like. So when we go into the Bible, the Bible mentions color all throughout the Bible. The problem is we haven't been taught that. So now we're going to give you another example of how important it is to know your color, your heritage, your race, know your history. Let's get um we're gonna just show you a wor another worldly example. Let's get to the next video. 
New at six, it's been more than 50 years in the making for some comic book fans. The movie version of the Black Panther superhero series has people buzzing across the country. Several theaters have screenings tonight, although the film doesn't officially open nationwide until tomorrow. Katrina Weber spoke to some local fans who plan to make it a night to remember. The world is changing. A comic book world heading into movie theaters. The Marvel character Black Panther is roaring onto the big screen in his own film. The most uh, decorated superhero, the most intelligent one. He's also the first African-American one, the king of the fictional country of Wakanda in a film featuring a largely African-American cast. My son, it is your time. Yeah, I wanted to do something that we'd never done before. Longtime fan Manira Small decided to go big and throw a Hollywood-style watch party. This is my neck piece that I am wearing. The excitement is contagious. Extremely excited. Um, I'll be honest, not so much for the storyline, but for the fashion. My whole family is going to be there. Uh, my, I've got relatives coming in from Oklahoma. Small has sold out two local theaters, more than 300 attending. Well, I definitely feel red carpet ready, or in this case, purple carpet. This is the actual carpet that will be at the theater. But one thing Small won't let us see today is what she plans to wear. It'll be a party packed with pride. The characters in these comics look like us. Yes, it's a movie, but it's the celebration of our culture. With the social climate of our country, people of color need a happy moment right now. And they hope that happiness lasts long after the closing credits. Katrina Weber, KSAT 12 News. Now, so let's just keep this in perspective. We're talking about a comic book. You got these people this excited over a comic book character talking about it's so great to see themselves in these type of roles and these type of things like that. And you mean to tell me that it don't matter what color the greatest man on the earth is? Come on, man. That's some heavy witchcraft right there. We're not falling for that. Let's get, uh, let's get, let's get numbers 12. Because remember, you know, every time we look at uh, characters in the Bible, uh, they got everybody as uh, white. Um, you got, uh, you had the uh, movie, what, The Ten Commandments with Charleston Heston. You had, uh, what else you had? Uh, I forget the name. Passion of the Christ, Son of God. All of these ways that they display, they put themselves in these high roles. And what do we get? We get, um, I don't know, what do we get? I don't think we got any. <laughs> any we got the Book of Clarence. We got that. <laughs> you got that. But uh, as far as playing any serious biblical roles, they're not going to let us do that. So, and then when you do uh, play you know, something that they think should be white, they get upset about that. So let's get Numbers 12. Let's deal with Mary. It's the book of Numbers, chapter 12, verse 7. My servant Moses is not so, who is faithful in all mine house. We With him will I speak mouth to mouth. So the Lord is letting you know how he dealt with Moses. He spoke directly to Moses. Read. Even apparently, and not in dark speeches. And the similitude of the Lord shall he behold. Wherefore then, were ye not afraid to speak against my servant Moses? Because what happened? Aaron and Miriam were speaking against Moses. And the Lord had to check me like, look, I, this is my man right here that I deal with face to face. I don't even tell him stuff in parables. I give it to him straight. And y'all want to speak against Moses? Read. And the anger of the Lord was kindled against them, and he departed. And the cloud departed from off the tabernacle. And behold, Miriam became leprous. White as snow. Hold on, she became what? Miriam became leprous, white as snow. So she became white as snow. So this is already giving you a big clue on what color Miriam was right here. They say she became white as snow. Read. And Aaron looked upon Miriam, and behold, she was leprous. And let's see if they say, oh, no, this is Marilyn Monroe. Let's see what Aaron said. Read. And Aaron said unto Moses, alas, my lord, I beseech thee. Lay not the sin upon us, wherein we have done foolishly, and wherein we have sinned. Let her not be as one dead. Let her not be as Marilyn Monroe. Let her not be as one dead. Read. Of whom the flesh is half consumed, and he cometh out of his mother's womb. So he said that when she turned white, she looked like she was half dead. So this is, come on, folks. 
We gotta we gotta keep it moving. Now let's go ahead. Let's go ahead. Let's get the hair because the epitome of beauty in America is what a, a blonde hair white woman. Which doll is the pretty doll? Which doll is the nice doll? Which doll is the bad doll? Which doll is the nice doll? And why is that doll pretty? Because she's white and he has two eyes. Which doll is the ugly doll? Why is that doll ugly? Because he because he's black. Which doll looks most like you? Yeah, which one looks like you? And that one. Okay. That's if if you ask anybody like what's the standard of beauty in America, they're going to tell you somebody like uh, Marilyn Monroe or somebody on that line. I don't know who they got out there right now, but somebody in that vein. So it's going to be a white woman with blonde hair. So let's read about the white woman with blonde hair in the scriptures. Let's go get the uh, Leviticus thirteen. This is the book of Leviticus, chapter thirteen, verse twenty-nine. If a man or woman have a plague upon the head or the beard, so if you got a plague upon your head or your beard, read. Then the priest shall see the plague. Because you used to have, if you got a plague, you had to go see the priest. Read. And behold, if it be in the skin. Uh, I messed that up. Let me start from the top. Okay. It's the book of Leviticus, chapter 13, verse 29. If a man or woman have a plague upon the head or the beard. So we're talking about a plague upon the head or the beard. Read. Then the priest shall see the plague. And behold, if it be in the sight deeper than the skin. And there be in it a yellow thin hair. So we talking about blonde hair right now. Then the priest shall pronounce him unclean. No, the priest say they beautiful. The priest shall pronounce him unclean. No, the priest say blondes have more fun. The priest shall pronounce him unclean. Read. It is a dry scowl, even a leprosy upon the head or beard. So that right there, that's a curse from God. That's what the Bible's telling you right there. So that image that America gives you of the blonde a uh, hair, a uh, white woman is a standard of beauty. God ain't dealing with that. We already Solomon already said, I'm black and I'm beautiful. That's what God is dealing with in the Bible. Let's get uh let's go ahead and run another example because I want to show another example. Let's see what the young sister got to say here. Because remember, like I say, they saying even white folks say color don't matter. So let's see, let's see what kind of reaction this sister's getting. One of the big uh, points that some people were upset about was you as a black woman playing this character versus the original um, depiction yeah. of Ariel. And when you watch the movie, what I thought was dope was it's not just your character. It's it's very much a representation of all cultures yes. in the movie. So how did you feel about that? You know what I mean? And how did you feel about having to face that kind of criticism from people that just wasn't feeling what we feel in? Yeah, well, I honestly was expecting it. Yeah. yeah. You know, I think we as black people, we already expect just how society is sometimes. So I wasn't really shocked. Okay. Mm -hmm. Of course, when you see stuff like that, you're human. It hurts your feelings yeah. a little bit. Yeah. But I just thought of the bigger picture and how blessed and excited I am to be in this position and to be able to represent for all of the black and brown little children mm -hmm. and boys and girls and adults of today. I mean, we deserve to see ourselves as our heroes. And I know what it would have done for me if I would have seen a black mermaid as right. Ariel when I was little. So I'm just so grateful, and that's all I all I focus on. So hold on, she said she talking about black heroes that she would be excited for a black mermaid. And you mean to tell me that people that our people wouldn't be excited about seeing a black Christ if they knew that Christ was black? Is that really what you want us to believe? That color don't matter. When we're hearing all of this, uh, you know, uh, so-called white people are mad, you know, because they, they cast a mermaid role for a black woman. They had a fit about that. But then these same people want to tell you it don't matter what color Christ is. Let's see what the scriptures say. Let's go to John 7 and 38. This is the book of John, chapter 7, verse 38. He that believeth on me, as the scripture hath said. So Christ said we got to do what? He that believeth on me, as the scripture hath said, out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water. So Christ said, we got to believe on him as the scriptures say. Why? So you got to ask yourself, why would Christ say that? Why, what made him say that? We got to believe on him as the scriptures has said. 
Let's find out. Let's go to Matthews 24 and 5. Let's see what Christ was referring to. One of the things he was referring to. This is the book of Matthew, chapter 24, verse 5. For many shall come in my name, saying, I am Christ, and shall deceive many. So Christ is letting you know there's going to be false Christ coming, saying they are Christ, and deceive many. Meaning many people would be deceived by this fake Christ. Go to verse 11. Verse 11. And many false prophets shall rise and shall deceive many. So guess what? As the false Christ come out, false prophets are going to rise up teaching about this false Christ. Let's jump down to verse 24. Verse 24. For there shall arise false Christ and false prophets and shall show great signs and wonders insomuch that if it were possible, they shall deceive the very elect. So Christ said they would show so many great works that if it was possible, they would deceive the very elect. So now we're going to go back in history. We're going to go back in history. Let's get the image. Let's get the book, The Image of Black and Western Arts. Let's get that book right there. This is the book, The Image of the Black and Western Art. Okay, so let's go to the next page. What does that say right there? Line 47, king of the Moors submitting to the Antichrist. So let's go look at the picture. Let's check it. Let's check the picture out. Let's see what this is talking about because it's saying Moors. So who is that right there? Is that not what we see in a lot of churches right there? They're saying that this right here, these are the Moors submitting to the Antichrist. And they're giving up the crown. You see that right there? So let's go to, uh, let's see what, so this is the Antichrist. So let's go into the scriptures and see what Christ of the Bible look like. Let's get that. Let's go to Revelations 1 to 13, verse 10. Let's get verse 10 and read down. Verse 10, I was in the spirit on the Lord's day and heard behind me a great voice as of a trumpet. So he heard a voice behind him. This is John. Heard a voice behind him. Read. Saying, I am Alpha and Omega, the first and the last. And what thou seest? Write in a book. So he turned around. He said, what you see, write in a book. Read. And send it unto the seven churches, which are in Asia, unto Ephesus, and unto Smyrna, and unto Pergamos, and unto Thyatira, and unto Sardis, and unto Philadelphia, and unto Laodicea. Okay, read. And I turned to see the voice that spake with me. So this is like you know that John was actually looking. <laughs> he turned back to look to see who was talking to him. Read. And being turned. I saw seven golden candlesticks, and in the midst of the seven golden candlesticks, one like unto the Son of Man. He said, this brother looked like Christ. Clothed with a garment down to the foot, and girt about the paps with a golden girdle. His head and his hairs were white like wool. His head and his hairs were what? White like wool. Read. As white as snow, and his eyes were as a flame of fire. Because of... Whites of his eyes are red because he drank wine. So this is giving you the color and the texture of his hair. Also, the color of his, the whites of his eyes. Read. And his feet like unto fine brass, as if they burned in a furnace. So let you know that Christ was a dark-skinned brother. So now, when we look at the photos of the Antichrist, he's the exact opposite of what we read here in Revelations. So now some people might say, well, that was John and that was a vision. And that, let's see. Let's see. Uh, because they say after he died, I heard all kinds of crazy stuff. After he died, he changed the, he went from white to black. I've heard all kinds of crazy stuff. So let's see what Daniel saw because Daniel saw Christ before, uh, before he died. This is the book of Daniel, chapter 10, verse 5. Then I lifted up mine eyes and looked. And behold, a certain man clothed in linen, whose loins were girded with fine gold of euphaz. Wait. His body also was like the barrel, and his face as the appearance of lightning, and his eyes as lamps of fire, and his arms and his feet like in color to polished brass. Hold on, his arms and his feet like in what? Like in color to polished brass. So that's the same description that John gave. That's the same exact description. Finish it up. And the voice of his words, like as the voice of a multitude. So Christ was a black man. So now when you look at that image of um, the Antichrist, 
that they were uh, given, uh, that they were uh, submitting to, that the Moors or the Israelites were submitting to, it doesn't look anything like what we just read here. So what happened? Let's go to uh, Revelations 2 and 9. Because remember, you know, that, that image that we see uh, that they have Christ portrayed as, as, as uh, uh, you know, for the most part, as a real man named Caesar Borgia. So now we're going to go to um, Revelations 2 and 9 because Christ spoke about that. Christ spoke about that. Read that. It's the book of Revelations, chapter 2, verse 9. I know thy works and tribulation and poverty, but thou art rich. And I know the blasphemy of them which say they are Jews. He knows the what? I know the blasphemy of them which say they are Jews and are not, but are the synagogue of Satan. So you got to ask yourself, like, what was Christ talking about? He said he knows the blasphemy of those that say they are Jews and are not, but are the synagogue of Satan. So we're going to go back in history. Let's go back in the history. Let's get the uh, Westminster. Uh, dictionary of the Bible. We're going to read a little bit in here. Let's, let's get some history on this, what Christ was talking about. This is the Westminster Dictionary of the Bible. This is the definition for Herod the Great. He was the second son of the Idumean Antipas. The Idumean. I want y'all to remember that word, Idumean. Or Antipater by his wife, Cyp Cyprus, who was the, who was of the same race, thus neither by the father's nor by the mother's side was Herod a real Jew. So Herod was not a real Jew, read. Though the Idumeans, who had been conquered in 125 BC. They've been conquered when? In 125 BC. Read. By John Hycranus and compelled to be circumcised. So they were forced to be circumcised. And adopt Judaism had now became nominally Jews. They had became what? Nominally Jews. So these are the people that Christ is talking about that claim to be in Jews that are not, but are the synagogue of Satan. So now let's get more history. Let's go to, uh, let's get, first let's get Ezekiel 36 and 5. And then we're going to get a little bit more history. Let's get that. So remember, he's an Idumean. Herod is an Idumean or an Edomite. So let, let's get the prophecy of what the uh, prophet um, Ezekiel says is going to happen with the Idumeans or the Edomites. This is the book of Ezekiel, chapter 36, verse 5. Therefore, thus saith the Lord God, surely in the fire of my jealousy have I spoken against the residue of the heathen. So we're talking about heathen. And against all Idumea, which have appointed my land into their possession. So God says the Idumeans would appoint his land, Jerusalem, into their possession. So now when we look and see who's in Israel now, we already read what the Jews look like. Understand that. So now we're getting into who's in the land right now, who's calling themselves the Jews, who was calling themselves the Jews back then in the time of Christ. Let's finish this up. With the joy of all their heart, with the spiteful minds, to cast it out for a prey. Okay, so we finished up on that. So we're going to get another historical book to go deeper into um, what Christ was talking about in Revelations 2 and 9. Um, those that are saying they're Jews and are not. So let's get the history of the Jews from the destruction of Jerusalem. Let's get that book. This is the book, The History of the Jews from the Destruction of Jerusalem to the Present Time. Upon the entire reduction of the holy city, Herod, a stranger and Idumean, ascended to the throne of Judea. So this is letting you know that a stranger ascended to the, to the throne of Jerusalem. Read. Herod, who proved one of the greatest tyrants ever recorded in history, commenced his reign with a cruel persecution of the adherents of Antiochus, the most affluent among them. He caused to be put to death and confiscated their estates in order to replenish his empty coffers. Read. The tyrant decoyed Hycranus from Parthia, where he had fled for shelter, and contrary to the most solemn engagements, caused him to be assassinated. So he's going through just wiping out all our leadership. But jump down, go down to, go down a little bit more. I want to get to the point right here, right here, right here. After Herod had destroyed the greatest part of his supposed enemies, he began to exhibit a marked contempt 
for the Jewish religion and laws. So he hated our religion. He hated our laws, Read From the beginning of his reign to the final destruction of the temple, the high priest had no hereditary rights. So he took away the hereditary rights of the priests. So because the Levites were set up as a priest by the Most High God, read. But were set up and removed at his pleasure. So he he just did what he wanted to do. He got rid of all of our leadership. That's why when you read uh, John 11 and 47, it talks about the fear that they had about the Romans taking away their places that they had. Read. And that of his successors. He also destroyed the authority of the Grand Sanhedrin. So he basically got rid of all our leadership pretty much took over everything. He was running the show, read. And burnt the Jewish records. Burned all our records. That he might be thought originally as an Israelite. So he wanted people to think that he was an Israelite. So now when we read Revelations 2 and 9, let's jump back to Revelations 2 and 9 real quick because this is what Christ was talking about because a lot of times we read this scripture, we don't know what he's talking about. I just want to read that real quick. This is the book of Revelation, chapter 2, verse 9. I know thy works, and tribulation, and poverty, but thou art rich, and I know the blasphemy of them which say they are Jews, and are not, but are the synagogue of Satan. So this is letting you know who he was talking about. So now what we're going to do is we're going to go to the 1611 King James Bible. This is an original translation of the Bible, and here we have the family tree of Esau. So to go to... That's, Zoom in on Adumians. See that? Adumians. Right there, there's Herod the Great. That's who we're reading about. So then you got Herod, you got Herodias, Philip, and all of those down there. So this is letting you know that Herod is a descendant of Esau. And uh, then they got him also under there, under the Adumians. So that's why when we read earlier, he's an Adumian. Adumians descend from Esau. So these are this is the Edomite nation right here. So let's go to the birth of Esau. Let's see what the Bible has to say about Esau. Let's get that. This is the book of Genesis, chapter 25, verse 21. And Isaac entreated the Lord for his wife because she was barren. And the Lord was entreated of him, and Rebekah his wife conceived. And the children struggled together within her. And she said, If it be so, why am I thus? And she went to inquire of the Lord. And the Lord said unto her, Two nations are in thy womb, and two manner of people shall be separated from thy bowels. So, so Rebecca got pregnant. She's having a birth problem. So she went to go inquire of God to see what's going on. Because if, I'm, if this pregnancy is supposed to be blessed by you, why am I having all these pregnancy problems? So read that part again. Read verse 23 again. And the Lord said unto her, Two nations are in thy womb. So he said, two nations are in your womb. Read. And two manner of people shall be separated from thy bowels. So two totally manner of people is going to be separated as your bowels. Read. And the one people shall be stronger than the other people. Hold on. It said the one people shall be what? And the one people shall be stronger than the other people. So now when we look at sports, entertainment, all of those things, who's stronger than the other people? This is obvious right here. This is obvious. You can just watch any basketball game, any football game, any track meet. You got a hundred uh, meter dash, you won't see one Edomite even on the screen when they are uh, running against uh, the Israelites. Like you got Hussein Bolt. They they not even they don't even qualify. I don't even think they qualify to even run out there with the water. To be honest with you, but that's a whole nother story. It says, read that again. Read verse twenty three again. And the Lord said unto her. Two nations are in thy womb, and two manner of people shall be separated from thy bowels. And the one people shall be stronger than the other people, and the elder shall serve the younger. Read. And when her days to be delivered were fulfilled, behold, there were twins in her womb. And the first came out red all over, like in hairy garment. And they called his name Esau. So we got another color. It says the first came out red all over, and they called his name Esau. So now we're dealing with the color red. Red is the color that we're dealing with right there. So let's go to, let's see. Let's go back to uh, Revelations 2 and 9. This is the book of Revelation, chapter 2, verse 9. I know thy works, and tribulation, and poverty, but thou art rich, 
And I know the blasphemy of them which say they are Jews and are not, but are the synagogue of Satan. So it says they are the synagogue of Satan. So Christ is calling those people that was calling themselves Jews back then, which were the Idumeans or the Edomites, the synagogue of Satan. Keep reading. Fear none of those things which thou shalt suffer. Behold, the devil shall cast some of you into prison. So he said these same people, are he called them also the devil. That's what Christ said, the devil. Read. That ye may be tried, and ye shall have tribulation ten days. Read. Be thou faithful unto death, and I will give thee a crown of life. So why did Christ say that? Be faithful unto death, and I will give you a crown of life. Why did he say that? Why did he say these, these, uh, these people that's saying they Jews and are not will throw some of you in the prison? Let's go to, uh, let's find out. Let's go to Acts 12. This is the book of Acts chapter 12, verse 1. Now about that time, Herod the king. Who? Who is the king? Herod the king. This is Herod Agrippa, first king of Palestine. Uh, he ruled from uh, 37 AD to 44 AD. So read that again. Now about that time, Herod the king stretched forth his hand to vex certain of the church. And he killed James, the brother of John, with the sword. He did what? He killed James, the brother of John, with the sword. Now, didn't we just read about that in Revelations 2 and 10? That we that Christ was warned them to be faithful unto death? Read, uh, read, um, read verse 3. And because he saw it pleased the Jews, he proceeded further to take Peter also. Read. Then were the days of unleavened bread. Keep read. And when he had apprehended him, he put him in prison. Hold on. He did what to Peter? He put him in prison. That's just, just what Christ was talking about in Revelations 2, 9, and 10. Read. And delivered him to four quaternions of soldiers to keep him, intending after Easter to bring him forth to the people. Because he was going to kill Peter also. So this is who Christ is talking about right here. So when we read Revelations 2 and 9, He's talking about the Idumean or the Edomite nation or what you call today your Caucasian race, your European, your uh, your American, uh, white Americans. That's who these. That's who they descend from. They are all descendants of Esau. So let's jump to Revelations 12 because Revelations 12 is is written as a similitude. It says the same exact thing. Um, it's saying the same thing that you're reading throughout the Bible, but it's written as a parable. So I want to show you because we're dealing with the color red. Revelations 12 and 1. This is the book of Revelation, chapter 12, verse 1. And there appeared a great wonder in heaven, a woman clothed with the sun and the moon under her feet and upon her head a crown of 12 stars. So these 12, the woman represents Israel. The 12 stars represents the 12 tribes of Israel. That's who that represents. Let's get, um, just to, to prove that, let's go to um, Genesis 37 and 7. Because like I said, Revelation is written as a parable. It's not written plain. This is the book of Genesis, chapter 37, verse 7. For behold, we were binding sheaves in the field, and lo, my sheaf arose and also stood upright. And behold, your sheep stood round about and made obeisance to my sheep. And his brethren said unto him, Shalt thou indeed reign over us? Read. Or shalt thou indeed have dominion over us? And they hated him, yet the more for his dreams and for his words. And he dreamed yet another dream, and told it his brethren, and said, Behold, I have dreamed a dream more. And behold, the sun and the moon and the 11 stars made obeisance to me. So he says the 11 stars made obeisance to me because guess what? He's the 12th star. So he's letting you know that those stars represent the 12 tribes of the children of Israel. So when we go back to Revelations 12, let's get that again. That sun and that moon. He also mentioned that. Revelation chapter 12, verse 1. And there appeared a great wonder in heaven, a woman clothed with the sun and the moon under her feet and upon her head a crown of 12 stars. And she being with child cried 
travailing in birth and pain to be delivered. And there appeared another wonder in heaven. And behold, a great red dragon. Hold on, a great what? A great red dragon. There go that color red again, read. Having seven heads and ten horns and seven crowns upon his heads. So now I know what people are thinking. They, they're thinking that once you're talking about a dragon, he's up in heaven, he's up in the sky, he's flying around. But that's not what the scriptures is talking about. Because remember, we just read uh, a little while ago, we're dealing with the 12 tribes of Israel. That's what we're talking about. So this heaven is going into leadership. It's talking about leadership. So if we go to, let's get Deuteronomy uh, 11. So I'm, uh, we're going to expound a little bit on heaven. This is the book of Deuteronomy, chapter 11, verse 21. That your days may be multiplied, and the days of your children in the land, which the Lord swear unto your fathers, to give them as the days of heaven upon the earth. As the days of what? As the days of heaven upon the earth. Because remember we, what we read back in Revelation 12, they saw a great drag, a great red dragon is talking about in heaven. But this is not talking about the type of heaven you're thinking that you've been taught in church. This is actually talking about rulership or leadership. This is talking about the rulers of the earth. This is heaven going into heaven. And this is what this is breaking down for you right now. Read that, read that again. That your days may be multiplied, and the days of your children in the land which the Lord swear unto your fathers to give them as the days of heaven upon the earth. So let's see what the days of heaven upon the earth are. Keep reading. For if ye shall diligently keep all these commandments, which I command you to do. So this is the promise that the Lord made to the Israelites. Read. To love the Lord your God, to walk in all his ways, and to cleave unto him. Then will the Lord drive out all these nations from before you, and ye shall possess greater nations and mightier than yourselves. Read. Every place whereupon the soles of your feet shall tread shall be yours. From the wilderness and Lebanon, from the river, the river Euphrates, even unto the uttermost sea shall your coast be. There shall no man be able to stand before you, for the Lord your God shall lay the fear of you and the dread of you upon all the land that ye shall tread upon, as he hath said unto you. So you see that? So everywhere that your foot will land, this is the Lord talking to the Israelites if they kept the commandments. But guess what? They didn't keep the commandments. So guess who's in their, in their kingdom or in their heaven right now? Because everywhere that American flag lands, guess what? They taking that territory. When America's ships show up outside of your coastline, that fear and the dread show up. When you see those jets come over. So right now, they're actually in their kingdom. But we're supposed to be in our kingdom, but we don't want to keep the commandments. So guess what? This is what Revelation is getting into right here. So when we go back, let's read verse 3 again right here. It's the book of Revelation, chapter 12, verse 3. And there appeared another wonder in heaven, and behold, a great red dragon. So this great red dragon is the Edomite Empire. This is talking about uh, the, the Edomite or the, 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 the kingdom of Esau, the Edomite Empire. Read. Having seven heads and ten horns and seven crowns upon his head. So now somebody might say, well, nah, that's talking about a literal dragon. That's not talking about this, talking about that. Okay, let's see what the scholars say. Let's go get that book right there. Let's get this book. Let's get the title of the book. This is the book, The Roman Empire, The Empire of the Edomite. Written in what year? 1853. 1853. So guess what? What none of you Negroes reading that? Let's see what, let's see what, let's see what the scholars say. Read that right there. Concerning the monster depicted in the 13th chapter of the Revelation of St. John, Bishop Newton writes thus, No doubt is to be made that this beast is designed to represent the Roman Empire. Hold on, the scholar said what? This beast is designed to represent the Roman Empire. You see what the scholars are saying, read. For thus, for both ancients and moderns, Papists and Protestants are agreed. So they, all of their uh, religious leaders agree, read. The only controversy is whether it be Rome pagan or Christian Imperial or papal. So these are different groups trying to duck the smoke. All of them going to get the smoke because they all descend from Esau or the Roman Empire. Read. Little less than like the agreement exists. 
as the bishop also remarks, with regard to the dominion intended by the fourth beast of the prophecy of Daniel, this fourth kingdom can be none other than the Roman Empire. You see that? They're letting you know. They know for sure it's the Roman Empire. Read. And Calment himself acknowledges that is it is usually explained of the Roman Empire. Jump down to the next highlighted area, right there. The fourth beast of Daniel, we must have recourse to the revelation of St. John. For his prophecy, from his prophecy, we learned that this beast had seven heads and ten horns. And upon his horns, ten crowns, that he was like unto a leopard, and his feet were as the feet of a bear, and his mouth as the mouth of a lion. That, like Esau, he was scarlet colored. So he said, like Esau, he's red, scarlet covered, colored. So this is letting you know, the scholars know who, <laughs> who this red dragon is. So let's go back. Let's go back to Revelation 12. So that's what I'm saying. Color's important. It's all throughout the Bible. So don't let no fake Christian pastor fool you into thinking that color don't matter. It ain't in the Bible. It don't matter. All colors and all of that stuff. That's foolishness. And that's what we're showing you here today. And I and we challenge any of the pastors to prove us wrong. That's what we do. So let's go to um see, I want to go back to Revelations 3 and 4. This is the book of Revelations, chapter 12, verse 3. And there appeared another wonder in heaven, and behold, a great red dragon having seven heads and ten horns, and seven crowns upon his heads. And his tail drew the third part of the stars of heaven, and did cast them to the earth. And the dragon stood before the woman, which was ready to be delivered, for to devour her child as soon as it was born. So it said to devour it. So this child is talking about Christ. So, and read that again, because it says it threw uh, a third part of the stars. I want to read verse four again. And his tail drew the third part of the stars of heaven, and it cast them to the earth. Because at that time when Christ uh, walked the earth, there were only three um, tribes in the land. It was three main tribes in the land of um, Jerusalem. You had Judah, Benjamin, and Levi. And you can read about that in, in the book of Ezra, uh, the first chapter and the fourth verse. You can read about those are the main three tribes that went back to rebuild the temple. So those third part of the 12, because remember up above in verse one, it said it was 12 stars. So a third part of that is the three stars that we just talked about. So they were cast down to the earth, meaning cast down in the sl uh, slavery or captivity. So you can read about that. Uh, matter of fact, we can just get that. Let's get that in Lamentations 2 and 1 real quick, just to show you that's what that's talking about. Because like I said, Revelation is written as a parable. So you have to understand, it's not written plain. This is the book of Lamentations, chapter 2, verse 1. How have the Lord covered the daughter of Zion? The daughter of Zion. This is talking about the Israelite. With a cloud in his anger. Because they sin. Read. And cast down from heaven unto the earth. He cast down from what? And cast down from heaven unto the earth. So he cast him down from heaven, rulership, into captivity. That's what that's, what that's talking about right there. Read. The beauty of Israel, and remember not his footstool in the day of his anger. So that's what that's talking about. So when we go back to Revelation 12, and then when we read verse 4, read that again. Revelation chapter 12, verse 4. And his tail drew the third part of the stars of heaven, and did cast them to the earth. Read. And the dragon stood before the woman, which was ready to be delivered. For to devour her child as soon as it was born. So we can so let's let's go back and let's read about that. So who was ready to kill Christ as soon as he was born? Let's go read about that. Let's go read about that. Let's go to Matt uh where I want to go. Matthew 2 and 13. Let's get that. Matthew 2 and 13. So who was ready to kill Christ as soon as he was born? This is the book of Matthew, chapter 2, verse 13. And when they were departed, behold, the angel of the Lord appeareth to Joseph in a dream, saying, Arise, and take the young child and his mother, and flee into Egypt, and be thou there until I bring thee word. For Herod will seek the young child to destroy him. Who's going to try to kill Christ? For Herod 
will seek the young child to destroy him. So it's like, you know, that Herod, that's that great, that's, he was a representation of the Roman Empire, that great red dragon that we read back in Revelation 12 was going to try to kill Christ. Keep reading. When he arose, he took the young child and his mother by night and departed into Egypt. So why did he run into Egypt? We brought it out earlier. The Egyptians were what, a dark-skinned nation? So if he was white, would he have been able to hide in Egypt? Come on, folks. We know better than that. So that's because he looked like the Egyptians. He could blend in and hide from Herod. Because remember, Herod was trying to kill, I think he killed everybody three and under. So he was, he was getting out of there. He got out of there. So let's go to, so why did, what, what made Herod want to kill Christ? Why would he want to kill? Because in Christianity, they say Christ coming back to save everybody. So you would think, you'd be like, hey, he coming back to save me. Why, why would he want to kill him? Let's get um, Acts 26, 1 through 3. I want y'all to get the understanding on why Herod wanted to kill Christ. Let's get that. This is the book of Acts, chapter 26, verse 1. Then Agrippa said unto Paul, Thou art permitted to speak for thyself. Then Paul stretched forth the hand and answered for himself. Let's see what Paul said. I think myself happy, King Agrippa, because I shall answer for myself this day before thee, touching all the things thereof I am accused of the Jews, especially because I know thee to be an expert in all customs and questions which are among the Jews. Hold on, he knew that he was a what? Because I know thee to be, a, to be expert in all customs and questions which are among the Jews. Wherefore, I beseech thee to hear me patiently. So why was he an expert in all things to do with the Jews? Let's go to that family tree again. Let's go down underneath of Herod. So we read Herod the Great. Then you see uh, Herod, his son, underneath of that. Go down to the bottom. Now who do you see there? Agrippa. Let's go back up to the top. Let's roll back up. You see the Adumians there. That's who John Hycranus had uh, forced converted. And then when we get back up to the top, who's at the top? Esau. So now, this is starting to make more sense. So now, remember, Idumian, Edomites. So the plot thickens. So let's go to Isaiah 34. Let's see why Herod wanted to get rid of Christ. This is the book of Isaiah, chapter 34, verse 2. For the indignation of the Lord is upon all nations and his fury upon all their armies. He hath utterly destroyed them. He hath delivered them to the slaughter. Keep reading. Their slain also shall be cast out, and their stink shall come up out of their carcasses, and the mountains shall be melted with their blood. So this is a prophecy about the return of Christ. Let's read. And all the host of heaven shall be dissolved, and the heavens shall be rolled together as a scroll. So this is Christ bringing havoc on the earth. You got uh, thermonuclear destruction going on. That's why you got the, the clouds rolling together like a scroll reed. And all their hosts shall fall down. So that's all the aircraft, all the satellites, all of that stuff. God is going to throw that down. Christ is going to throw that down. Read. As the leaf falleth off from the vine, and as a falling fig from the fig tree. For my sword shall be bathed in heaven. So this heaven is talking about the rulers of the earth. It's not talking about he's bathing his sword in a bathtub up in heaven. That's not what he's talking about. It's talking about he's going to come down and kill the leaders of the earth. Behold, it shall come down upon Idumia. It's going to come down upon who? Upon Idumia and upon the people of my curse. To judgment. So it's the sword is coming down on who? Let's get the uh, let's get the family tree again. <laughs> Who's the sword of Christ coming down on? <laughs> let's get that again. The Idumian. Who falls under Idumians? Herod. So now you know why Herod wanted to kill Christ because he read these. He was in the school studying with the Jews, studying with the Israelites, and he seen that when this character, when Christ come upon the scene, he's gonna wipe out my whole entire nation. That's why he killed Christ. That's why he wanted to kill Christ. Y'all think he just woke up one day and said, I want to kill Christ? Let's go back to Revelations. We're going to show you that Revelation is going to say the same thing that we just read here in Isaiah. Let's go back to Revelation 12. We're going to read the same thing here that we read in Revelation 2 and 9 and what we just read in Isaiah 34. Let's go to Revelation 3 because I don't want them to forget the thought. Revelation 12 and 3. It's the book of Revelation, chapter 12, verse 3. And there appeared another wonder in heaven. 
And behold, a great red dragon. So we're dealing with the great red dragon. That's all I want right there. Jump down. Let's see what. Um, let's get more information on this red dragon. Jump down to Revelations. Uh, jump down to verse seven. Verse seven. And there was war in heaven. So this war is the same heaven that's in heaven is the same heaven that we read back in Isaiah 34. Not talking about the sky. It's talking about the rulers of the earth. We're fighting for the, who's over the earth, who's ruling the earth. Read. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon. That's that same red dragon or the Roman Empire, the Edomite nations that we read up in verse 3. And the dragon fought and his angels. That's his, that's his leadership. All his generals, all of those, those are his angels. Read. And prevailed not. They lost, just like what we read in Isaiah 34. Read. Neither was their place found anymore in heaven. Meaning that his rulership is over with. He's finished ruling the earth because Christ is setting up his kingdom. Read. And the great dragon was cast out, that old serpent called the devil and Satan. So who is that called? Called the devil and Satan. And what did he do? Which deceived the whole world. How did he receive? How did he deceive the whole world? We read that back in Revelations two and nine. He's telling everybody that he's the Jew, he's the Israelite, he's Christ, and he's not. He's the synagogue of Satan. That's saying the same thing here. Because in Revelation, let's go back to Revelations two and nine and read that again. Two Revelation and nine and ten. Revelation chapter two verse nine. I know thy works and tribulation and poverty, but thou art rich. And I know the blasphemy of them which say they are Jews and are not, but are the synagogue of Satan. So we got people in Israel now saying they're the Jews. They got everybody fooled. If you ask somebody who the Jew is, who they going to say the Jew is? They going to say me? <laughs> they going to say another Negro? No, they going to say the people that's in Israel. So that's how they deceive the whole world. Got everybody thinking they the Jew. They not the Jew. Read. Fear none of those things which thou shalt suffer. Behold, the devil. The deceiver shall cast some of you into prison. We already read that. Let's jump back to Revelations uh, 14. I mean, uh, yeah, that's what I want. I think it was. No, 12, I'm sorry. Revelations 12. Let's jump back. Verse 7. Verse 7. Revelation. Nah, yeah, no, nah, I want verse 7. I want to get verse 9. Revelation chapter 12, verse 9. And the great dragon was cast out, that old serpent, called the devil and Satan. That's just what we just read in Revelation uh, 2 and 9. Which deceived the whole world. He was cast out into the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. Watch this, read. And I heard a loud voice saying in heaven, Now is come salvation and strength and the kingdom of our God and the power of his Christ. It says, Now is come salvation. Now is come salvation. Read. For the accuser of our brethren is cast down, which accused them before our God day and night. Keep reading. And they overcame him by the blood of the Lamb. So they overcame him by Christ. And by the word of their testimony. And by us going out and teaching this gospel like we're teaching you right now. You're learning you're an Israelite. You're learning that you got to come back to keeping God's commandments. You're learning about who the devil really is. I mean, there's a spiritual devil, but you have his chosen people, which is the Edomite nation. Read. And they love not their lives unto the death. And they love not their lives unto what? Unto the death. That's the same thing that we read in Revelations 2 and 10. It's saying the same exact thing. So understand that, folks. So don't let anybody ever tell you that color don't matter. The Bible, we talked about many colors today. We talked about black, white, red, and yellow. All colors matter. All nations matter to God in the Bible. So with that, I say shalom, most high Christ bless.